Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about neural networks. And in particular, we're going to talk about deep learning. Um, unfortunately, deep learning is a career in itself, and I can't really go very deep today. See what I did there? That said, I want to give you a little bit of an intuition on how deep learning works and why you might want to use it. I'm going to start by um, showing you the, the history of deep learning. And I'm going to start out by um, looking at the perceptron. And what the perceptron is, is a single n artificial neuron. Now, 1957, Frank Rosenblatt invented the perceptron. Um, there were some papers that came before it, but really he's the guy credited with making it work. It was the very first machine that could um, actually see and classify images. Um, and this was, I think his working uh, model finally came out in 1960. This is pretty amazing stuff for the 1960s. Let's look at how the perceptron works. The perceptron takes a couple of inputs, x1, x2, x3, it could go on to xn, as many as you'd like, and it produces an output, 1 or 0, something is present or something isn't. The neuron fires or the neuron does not fire. And notice we're, we're making some biological analogies here. Um, sometimes those hold, sometimes they don't. And it, it doesn't really matter because this is a useful model. Um, so the point is, we take some inputs and then we, try, we decide to produce an output, 0 or 1, based on the contents. So now the question becomes, what goes in that circle? So here's the math. If we look at this very top one here, we can see that this is basically a linear function, right? We take those x's, the, the uh, input values that we have, we multiply them by weights, and if that, out, if that value exceeds some threshold that we set, we output a 1. Otherwise, we output a 0. So if I take that just one step further, I can, um, I can multiply the sums. And, and really what this is, is this is the same as this, right? We're just adding all these together. This is now a more generalized expression um, where we're also greater than or less than a threshold. Now, if I take this and I, um, if I generalize it and then um, take threshold, and I'm going to exchange threshold for b, and I'm going to subtract it from that side, I'm left with this inequality here, um, where if my weights times x, and notice also that this has been um, combined into matrix algebra, um, so now we're doing linear algebra, mul multiplying the weight matrix by the x matrix, adding um, this threshold value, and if it's greater than or less than or equal to 0, then now we're going to choose 1 or 0, one or zero as an output. So this is a very generalized form, and it looks a lot like linear regression. So that's pretty much how a perceptron works. It's not all that different. Um, maybe a few, a few small differences, but, but it's not really important right now. Let's um, look and see more of a, a concrete example of this. So this would be us implementing an AND gate using only x1 and x2. You can see that we can model this function pretty well. This is something a perceptron can do. And what we can see is, in, in this case, when x1 and x2 were both 1, we want the output to be 1. In all other cases, we want the output to be 0. If I were to graph that on a plane, I would see that 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0 are all zeros. But 1, 1 is filled in in this case because it's a 1. And I want you to notice that in this kind of model, this is something that a perceptron can easily do, we can easily separate the points that are 1 from the points that are 0 with a single line, a hyperplane. And so that's really important. That means that these two sides of the equation, or of these two out, uh, sets of outputs, are linearly separable. Now, this is really important because as awesome as they thought perceptrons were in the 1960s, they had a major limitation. And I'm going to show you what that is. All right, here's that limitation. So now I'm going to model the XOR, exclusive OR function. Now, an exclusive OR, as you, can as you probably remember, if, zero, if X1 and X2 are both 0, the output will be 0. If either x2 or x1 is 1, the output will be 1. But then, if x1 and x2 are, zero, are 1, the output will be 0, because this is an exclusive OR. If I were to plot that, you can see that we're 0 here, 0 here, but 1 here, 
and one here. There's no way to draw a single line that separates the zeros from the ones. You need a circle or ellipses. And so this is a nonlinear function. So something as simple as XOR can't be modeled by a perceptron. So the perceptron has failed us. We can't model really complex things. We, we, have, we have some limits to what we can do with perceptrons. And this is kind of where um, artificial neurons and thinking machines died for a while, until the 1980s. So let's fast forward to the 1980s. All of a sudden, um, some folks named Rummelhart, Hilton, Hinton, and uh, Williams wrote this, this paper called Learning Representations by Backpropagating Errors. And this is really important, because this let us stack perceptrons on top of each other. And uh, let me show you what that looks like. This is, this is called a multi-layer perceptron. And what we have here is now we'll have multiple layers of neurons that are stacked on top of one another. So you'll have an input layer and then one or more hidden layers in an output layer. And by adding these layers, what it lets us do is insert nonlinearities. And now that we can insert nonlinearities between these layers, what it lets us do is we can model more and more increasingly complex functions. XOR is no problem. In fact, in this kind of a network with a couple of hidden layers, it should theoretically be able to model pretty much any function. Now, I'm going to show you how this works, but before I go that far, I want to back up just a little bit and show you this thing called multinomial logistic regression. All right, so we saw before one perceptron. Now let's imagine three perceptrons side by side. Let's say that our task is we need to classify a letter as being an A, a B, or a C. So this is, this is a multinomial classification problem. Um, so what we can do is if we implemented the math that I had shown you before, we can train a we can train each of these as their own little classifier to um, be able to predict is this is this letter that I'm showing you an A? Is this letter I'm showing you a B? Is this letter I'm showing you a C? And then we're going to get some output like a three or a one or a zero, zero point two. Now back in um, logistic regression that we did in the beginning of the course, we use the sigmoid function to squash this into some number between a zero and a one. All right. Okay, so now we're going to use another function called softmax, and what softmax is going to do is it's going to take all of these outputs together, and it's going to squash them all together into a list of probabilities. And so what the, what's really cool here is that these, these numbers now are going to um, show us this entire system of classifiers as a single classifier, and it's confidence that the input is an A, a B, or a C. And now these probabilities should add up to one because these are prob well, because they're probabilities. So this is what softmax looks like, um, and softmax is a really important part of neural nets. Um, here's the Python implementation, and then here is the math. So what we're really doing is we're taking for any individual x sub i, um, these would be a score out of one of the one of the uh, the uh, logistic regressors that I'd shown you earlier. Um, it takes uh, e to that power, and then it sums e to all of the powers of the entire contents of uh, some vector x, so that uh, you normalize it by that, and this is going to give you for each observation, the probability of that observation versus the rest. So this is pretty cool stuff. Try it out. Okay, so with that piece of information, I'm going to now move on to the thing that makes multilayer perceptrons work, and that's stacking neurons. So what we can do is, remember this is the math from a single um, neuron. We can stack a neuron with another neuron but now we don't want to just stack those without without any sort of um, without introducing a, a nonlinearity. If we did that, it would really just be the same thing. It would just be a wider net. Um, so what we want to do is we want to introduce a nonlinearity. Now, a really easy non nonlinearity to use is called ReLU, and this is rectilinear activation. And what it is is it's a function that says. Um, return the max 0 or x. So if this is 
on is this is less than zero the answer is zero and if the, if it's greater than zero the answer is itself now um, this is really cool this is a really cool function because um, as we find out later it's going to be really important in training our network to be able to compute the derivatives of all of the functions in the network and this is a really easy function to create the compute the derivative of it's either zero or the derivative of x which happens to be one all right so this is an easy lazy nonlinearity that we can induce to stack neurons together and this is what lets us have that multi-layer perceptron now there's one other thing that I want to introduce you to, and this is the idea of backpropagation. And I'm going to try and introduce you to this idea with using almost no calculus. So, if you remember the, the picture I showed you of a multilayer perceptron, there's multiple, there's multiple perceptrons and they're all stacked together. And in, in, in between all of those, there's those nonlinearities, right? So, how do you train something like that? How do you, how do you deduce, deduce that into a numerical optimization problem. Well, it's actually not so hard. Um, what you can do is when you take any um, training example, you can show that to the untrained network and you propagate it all the way through. And then you need a cost function that measures how wrong you were, just like linear regression. But then what you're going to do is you're going to adjust every weight in every perceptron across the entire network by the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to any weight in the network. Um, and so that's pretty awesome because what you can do is you can chain all of those uh, those layers together and this is a this works with a chain rule in calculus that lets you uh, adjust everything all at once. So one complete forward and backward propagation of a network is called an epoch and what you'll do or an epoch depending on where you are um, I think epoch is the uh, Queen's English pronunciation, but it's the one that I prefer. Um, and so what you can do is you run this network for, um, you know, several epochs, of course, and uh, you'll show it, you'll show it your training examples, you'll compute how wrong you are, then you'll back propagate that the gradient of that error all the way through the network, adjusting every weight completely and then um, we'll do that over and over and over again and eventually the network will become more accurate now there's a problem with this though and that's the think about how many weights could could exist and how many updates would need to happen in even a modest size network let's say you had a thousand neurons and each one of those had 10 weights you can imagine that there's you know Sometimes in, in some networks that, that I've worked on, there can be millions of weights that need to be adjusted. And it's computationally very challenging. And this is, again, where neural networks kind of died, because we didn't have the computational power to really run them. Um, they became computationally intractable. And then there were other simpler methods, like support vector machines, that came out in the 90s that kind of took the emphasis away from neural nets because they were so computationally in, um, expensive. But then something great happened. The gamers came along and they changed the world for us in neural networks. You see what the gamers brought with them were video cards, um, graphics processors made to run video games. Now the thing about these video game um, processors, GPUs, is that they're just built to do linear algebra. They're linear algebra specific machines um, and that's what they do better than anything else. And if you think about that it's probably not hard to hard to imagine because the physics of a video game are very much a linear algebra problem. And so let me show you kind of an example of this. Um, now this is this is the biggest coolest thing that te that um, NVIDIA makes right now, and this is called the Tesla K80. But the Tesla K80, it's able to run 2.9 teraflops and it has almost 5,000 cores. Now, let's compare that to a really awesome CPU that exists today. Um, the Intel Xeon E5 is a pretty awesome um, server enterprise class uh, central processing unit. It, it only operates at 0.5 teraflops, and it only has 18 cores. 
Now, you can't run out, you can't run general computing on a GPU. That doesn't work. But GPUs are ama are made to be amazing linear algebra machines and they can rapidly rapidly accelerate the computations of our neural networks. And that's really important because then what happened was in about 2005, we started catching on to this, um, and then it's re this really progressed in 2008 with uh, speech and audio recognition with neural networks, but then in 2012, we started really being able to apply this to image recognition networks. So these are neural networks built to recognize images, right? And, and so the way the reason we can do that is because this gpu came along to give us such an uh, such a lift in computational power all right so let's talk for uh, um let's change topics just a little bit and talk specifically about image recognition networks i want to talk to you about this thing called the convolutional neural network so convolutional neural networks are um, a pretty big game changer they they came out in about 2012 and what they do is instead of that first layer looking at all of the features in an image individually, what they're going to do is they're able to look at the entire picture as a whole and they're able to take a slice out of that picture and then um, share weights on that slice and convolve in, 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 um, run this convolutional layer on it so that we can um, extract features and and learn deeper things about the image. So no longer are we looking at every pixel individually, but now we're looking at swatch, so swatches of pixels together. And how this works is this convolutional layer kind of runs back and forth across this, if this pink box were an image, it runs back and forth like a paintbrush. And what it then it does is it extracts features and it begins to learn things like shapes. Um, and then it'll propagate them up to different layers. Now remember before I had showed you the multi-layer perceptron, and I think my multi-layer perceptron had two hidden layers. Now what I'm going to show you here is a multi-layer convolutional neural network called AlexNet. AlexNet is pretty much state-of-the-art. Um, there's some stuff that's come across afterwards, but this is really pretty much it. And so what I'm showing you here is a convolutional neural network that's very deep. And when people say deep learning, this is what they're talking about. And so you can imagine we're looking at a, an image here that's um, 224 by 224. And this first convolutional layer is using a, um, is taking an 11 by 11 uh, swatch a patch of the image and it's moving four pixels at a time that's a, that's the stride across that image and it's taking all of that and it's it's building it into this convolutional layer that's then that the results of this are going to get pooled and then convoluted again and pooled and you can see that every time we do this our matrix gets deeper and smaller until we eventually get to this dense layer where we're going to start running our classifiers. And then at the very end, we're going to classify the results. And this kind of neural network has produced some pretty amazing results. Uh, these, this thing has, um, this network is commonly used to tr solve this problem called ImageNet. And what ImageNet is, is it is a, um, it's a collection of, I believe, a million images of 1,000 different um, classes. So this is a 1,000 way classifier. And um, this is a, a reference problem that's used to see how well we're able to solve image recognition problems. So really we're getting to the point here where AlexNet is able to recognize common visual items um, in photographs by using this technology. All right, so that is 20 minutes overview of everything from our friend the perceptron to convolutional neural nets next up i'm going to be doing a couple of videos where i'm going to be taking you through implementations of um of uh, multinomial logistic regression an mlp and then finally a covnet so let's do it